America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, would the clerk please call the roll? Mr. Reichert? Mr. Huppke? Here. Mr. Wigger? Mr. Hatt? Here. Mr. Callahan? Here. Mr. Forsyth? Here. Okay, let the record show that we have a foreign prison, then we may conduct official business. First order of which is the approval of the previous meeting, which was April 13 of 2015. Trustees, I will entertain a motion to approve the minutes as presented for that meeting or make corrections as you see fit. Motion. Second. Motion by Trustee Hag, seconded by Trustee Forsyth, to approve the minutes of the April 13, 2015 regular village board meeting. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Hack. Yes. Mr. Forsyth. Yes. Mr. Callahan. Yes. Mr. Huffman. Yes. Okay. Motion carries. The minutes are approved. Will you come to trustees in your packet? You have the bills and the payroll. The payroll is for the pay period ending March 28th of 2015 in the amount of $43,521.72. You have bills from the general fund totaling $23,991.21 and from the water and sewer fund bills totaling $7,696.41. Grand total of the bills outside of payroll is $31,687.62. Trustees, I will entertain a motion to pay the bills. Make a motion, we pay the bills. Motion by Trustee Huffman to pay the bills, seconded by... Second. Trustee Callahan. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Huffman? Yes. Mr. Callahan? Yes. Mr. Forsyth? Yes. Mr. Huffman? Yes. Okay. The motion carries and the bills will be paid as noted in the packet. Uh, we come to public comment and or questions about any non-agenda items. So if you're on the agenda later for a topic, you can wait until that topic comes up. Anybody here for anything that's not on the agenda? Yes. Come to the microphone and uh, identify yourself. And uh, my name is William Karczewski. I'm a resident over at Walnut Creek Subdivision. Uh, been there since roughly 1993. <clears throat> that intersection coming off of Howard onto Route 50 and jogs onto Corning or No Crawford is becoming more and more dangerous. You're talking about the Howard and Crawford? Yeah. Exactly. Um, now that the restaurant on the corner there has reconfigured their parking lot, I have a lot of trucks parking all the way up to the edge of the yellow which makes it nearly impossible to see to the north to pull out. This past weekend, we had a charity event in the new restaurant across the street. There were roughly, gonna guess, 150 motorcycles parked up and down the medium with their nose right up to Route 50, making it impossible to see out. The patrolman at the event, I stopped and asked him why they were parking on the street, and he said, well, I have no place else to put them. My thoughts are, if we're ever going to have an event, there should be adequate parking for said vehicles. Because now you're making it extremely dangerous for the residents in the village to travel on roads. I notice in the agenda, or in our uh, ordinances, we have all kinds of ordinances against fences being in, obstructing the view of traffic, other bushes, trees, houses, but it also states vehicles in there. But yet the patrolman on the scene at the time did nothing about it, taking care of the fact that we could not see either direction on there. Now, I have a young family that lives back there. We have chief police lives back there. I'm sure he can attest to the difficulty it takes to come out of that neighborhood. Wayne, you know, she should know. I would like to know, the, the biggest problem too is once this traffic is sitting, let's say at Tony's, you proceed to leave, they exit straight out on the 50. There's nothing stopping them from just driving through that lot and out on the 50. So now you think you have clear traffic, you start pulling out, they come out of their parking spot straight on the 50. I, I don't understand why we have so much access to Route 50 if it's supposed to be a state highway or a county highway. 
I was told that we couldn't, he couldn't make any provisions of stopping the, the traffic because it's a county road, but yet we can write tickets on that road. I just don't understand. I'm looking for answers. I'm looking for a reason why we're putting our residents in jeopardy at that intersection and why something hasn't been done. I think uh, it's fair to say that we have from time to time discussed with the, the businesses at that intersection the need to keep the, the corner line of sight open and um, they must not be hearing you. Well I think it's, it's up to us to go back and refresh them on it and also um, yeah, see if there's anything we can do. It's, it's an unfortunate design issue with the two streets not meeting up. It, it well, always it, causes... It has everything to do with the businesses on there being allowed to exit straight on to 50 like that. I don't, I don't feel that the park or the new restaurant across the street has adequate parking for the kind of flow that they're generating. On their soft opening alone, there was enough cars in that parking lot if any one of them pulled out, could have caused an accident. And I don't know how they got out without causing an accident. Yeah. Part of it too is we, uh, the folks there, have uh, acquired an additional lot next door, mm -hmm. which they intend to turn into parking space, and they haven't gotten that far yet. And their plans were to have the parking uh, across the street by the the storage place, as it has been in the past too. Uh, I but think in the this meantime, is, we're putting at risk. No, I think it. I think it, this is the uniqueness of they're just starting up, and they had uh, an event that we don't anticipate being a regular thing. With all due respect, it's been a problem for the last 18 years mm -hmm. or Bill, better. Bill, I couldn't agree with you more. Really, I've, I've I've said openly before that I think that the intersection at um, Crawford and Route 50 will be an intersection of a fatality at some point. And at that time it was because a lot of cars at the at the beer stube were parking beyond the utility pole that's there. Mm -hmm. And so in order to, uh, from Crawford on to Route 50, in order to see past that utility pole, you essentially had to stick the nose of your car out into Route 50. And it gets exacerbated when there are trucks parking on the other side of Route 50 in the shoulder because it happens with more frequency than I'd like to see. Absolutely. So I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that there is a problem. What the solution is, it's going to take some very creative thinking, but it's been a problem. And, and I, I, I know it when uh, Ms. Fredericks was, uh, Fredericks, correct, was mm -hmm. opening a fire pit. Yeah. I, I had mentioned to her at that point to please ensure that at least the vehicles in her lot stay behind that utility pole for the sake of traffic coming from Crawford. And I would, I would at least reiterate that point and ask us to make sure that we, we watch mm -hmm. that. And as far as Tony's, I, I never considered that. And I, you, you may have a good point there. Well, my problem is, is on Sunday during that event, there was a patrolman at this event allowing them to stack those bikes all the way down Route 50, all the way up to the entrance of the storage building, or you know, the storage facility there, making it impossible to see to the south. When I finally did get out by going around, I pulled in and asked the patrolman what he was thinking by allowing those bikes to park there. It's only after I brought it to his attention that he said, you know, you're right. And then they started moving bikes. Well, 20 minutes had passed. Luckily, no one was injured. I think we need to make sure that contract with the uh, parking lot across the street is actually in effect and that she plans on using that not just it's i sat with her sat sunday afternoon and she told me it was in effect and that's where i parked okay i parked there too yeah well now my question is is the traffic exiting tony's straight on to 50 could they not put up a, a concrete barrier there so the cars can't just exit straight out. I thought they have put them in and an out. I thought they put up a couple of the parking blocks there no yeah. they did they push them out in the 50. Well, if I could ask, uh, intercede, uh, Mr. Chernowski is absolutely right. That corner between Tony's, the now the new uh, area, the, the old beer stoop, and also the feed store, 
Uh, you, it depends on what trucks are there. You can't hardly see. It's a very bad intersection, and it's far worse because so much traffic comes off the uh, east side of town. Mm -hmm. You know, in fact, a lot of times we just ask people to use Beecher Road because you can see all the way because right. uh, you can't see it. You get the trucks or the cars from any of those businesses that can immediately cause a, uh, a real block problem. Uh, what I would ask that we consider doing is getting those neighborhood businesses into a meeting with our engineer and clearly define what areas are allowed to have access and clear that because Tony's leaving and going right on the Route 50, it's, uh, I'm surprised we don't have more accidents there. But your build actually brings a very good point up. And I'm not sure what happened on Sunday. I wasn't at the, how things are there. I just uh, asked my staff to be present because we knew there was going to be a large event to make sure we try to avoid accidents. If there were some uh, uh, matters, we'll make sure that that isn't uh, happening in the future. But that intersection is bad during prime time. The cars and traffic on Route 50 is mm -hmm. not being minimized, and it doesn't take much to have blind spots. Right. And it's all those businesses around that whole area that. Uh, right. Well, the, the traffic alone is a problem, but now, like I say, you've got you've got darts coming out of parking lots that you're not anticipating unless you're really on top of things. We've got a lot of young drivers back there. They're not going to be aware of you know, four different cars coming from four different directions. Somebody's going to get killed. But I would uh, ask that we uh, bring in the business owners from that with our engineer and look at this and define allowable areas so they understand it because they are all creeping on the Route 50. Uh, you know, there used to be blocks by one business, now they disappeared. And like I said, now you get there and the, t the front of the cars are right by Route 50, clearly in the, per se, right away, and it's all the businesses involved. Right. Well, and it's not only that, like Wade mentioned, there are semis at time that will go to the BP station, no park right there, and you might as well just turn around. There's no way you're going to Yeah, you can't see that. clear enough, and the no. traffic doesn't slow down. It's, no. you know, they can travel it's a good distance at 40 miles an hour. Uh, Surprised we haven't had serious accidents there. I mean, uh, our our uh, uh, matter with the motorcycle event they had, which we knew was going to be have some potential, be very large, was trying to keep the motorcycles from darting out into the traffic, and then we have another accident. So, um, and I don't know what the event schedule is. Is this going to be no, you know, every no, weekend? No, or? no, no, no. This is a one-time thing. No. Uh, in that fact, that comes up on the board, you know, after the fact, I can address the board, but yeah. I guess, uh, you know, as the engineer here is, I mean, these right-of-ways and what the state road allows, of course, we know we have to deal with the state of Illinois and our right-of-ways, but clearly these businesses need to be marked off, and uh, the beer stew has been a problem for way before we've been around mm -hmm. a couple of days, and how the parking was allowed. We push them back, and then they enter, they come back on, and like I said, luckily we haven't had a serious accident, but you know, Bill is absolutely correct. That subdivision is loaded with people. Probably one of the most populated areas of the town. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they only got three ways out of there. And I think a majority comes right down Howard Street. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you for your time. Yeah, I'll thank uh, you. Thank you. anticipate. We'll take that under advisement. Anyone else? Moving on down the agenda to reports of committee trustees, you have the clerk collector report in there relative to revenue uh, and the treasurer's report. If there's no questions on those, we'll go to the police chief's report. Uh, you going to do that now or do you want to do it down below? I actually have nothing to bring up to the board, some matters that So let's do it when we get to the topic down below, okay? Uh, engineer's report. Anything? Any updates? Uh, just status on the Wilmington Road generator lift station. Okay. The lift station generator. Um, the project's going to hold for a while, and we're still waiting for NICOR to install the service line. The, the best they've given us is mid-May, so 
once they have the servers installed, we can finish up the project for the most part done. Okay. Just to update. All right. Uh, under old business, okay. the downtown sidewalk snow removal. George. The last meeting, Attorney Mars was asked to review the village's authority to require downtown property owners to remove the snow from the sidewalks on the frontage. Mr. Mars has completed the review. Should the board wish to pursue this policy, the board should direct the village attorney to prepare an ordinance. In short, the memo says, yes, you have the statutory authority um, under uh, 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 case law from the Illinois Supreme Court. Um, should the board wish to pursue this policy, the board should direct the village attorney to prepare an ordinance where the attorney will need direction on the following topics, geographic scope, uh, where does the ordinance apply, the trigger event, is it a two inch snowfall, a four inch snowfall, any snowfall, um, three, the amount of time the property owner has to clear the snow, and four, the enforcement action, do we simply follow normal enforcement actions relative to a ticket or a notice. Okay. So. Trustees. We go back to our previous discussions. Uh, the discussions have related to uh, the enforcement issue uh, as opposed to the removal issue by the village. And uh, having said that, and the fact that we have authority to do that. The question is, uh, those four questions actually. Um, the geographic scope, are we looking solely at putting an ordinance into effect that will impact the businesses downtown? Are we looking at something that will um, have broader impact and that's what I'm concerned of is that the I mean the way this the way the uh, the statute itself is written I mean trustee Forsyth brought up a point at the last meeting theoretically this board could um, require every property owner of every sidewalk in town to remove the snow and ice and that of course is of some concern to me um, I would Probably not alone <laughs> I would uh, like to see this issue discussed and resolved more under the next board. So I would ask that we table the issue for consideration of the next board. Committee. Safety committee. Hmm? They were looking for things to do. Be a good thing for the safety committee. Huh. Mm -hmm. Or it could go to another committee. Yeah. All right. I and one of the reasons I, emotion. well one of the reasons I say that is I'm typically speaking I'm just uh, out of principle generally against the government expanding its powers onto private owners and so I don't want to sit here and <laughs> and be a part of that discussion when when my time is short lived so okay. I I would like to to not participate in that discussion I'll second that motion okay so we have a motion by Trustee Callahan second by Trustee Forsyth to move this item until after the next board is sworn in. All set. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Callahan. Yes. Mr. Forsyth. Yes. Mr. Hack. Yes. And Mr. Hubbard. Yes. Okay. Uh, we go on to the new business now, which is to ratify the permission. The chief, where'd he go? There we go. <laughs> that was what he was referring to earlier that I said we'll get to. Is he outside there? All right, thanks. Sorry, we, we move faster. No you way, you never move that fast. No, I got postponed. <laughs> I got moved to the, another meeting. But go ahead. Bring us up to date on the uh, fire pit bar and grill and what you found out. Well, the, the uh, run, I'm sorry. We discussed earlier. You're right, I was up early. Uh, I did talk to the County of Will, and they had issued a permit 
for their the uh, event, and uh, they 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 uh, and that run was uh, approved by the county uh, chairman and the liquor establishments over there that uh, the permit process. So that was all the paperwork was done properly for that motorcycle run. Um, but even though uh, and. The village still has to give green light to our mm -hmm. liquor establishments on these motorcycle runs and as we know the season of motorcycles comes out and they have these runs and they want to go to the uh, liquor establishments and you know and they're going to have to have a better traffic plan if they want to hold these events a quick question on that if the will county approved this event why did they not have any kind of deputies there following this event and policing the roads and traffic patterns I can't comment on the sheriff uh, you know when they uh, this topic got brought up at the last board meeting this is part of the gaming rules for the definition of poker runs and uh, benefits and the county executive has the authority to approve those matters the village doesn't have a poker run uh, ordinance to allow them and uh, the gaming, the state gaming people were the ones that are supposed to be handling this, and then they went back to the legislators and then added a provision to the county board of the counties that they, they go into can give the green light to these. Uh, there, it's not the first, even before the regulations come up. Every, everybody's doing some events. Some of them are for causes that are very noteworthy. Uh, a lot of them are just runs that come through the community on the way to the veterans' homes and that. Those are massive runs, Toys for Tots. Mm -hmm. But when they do those poker runs, uh, I think we all know what that involves, you know. So, you know, we're trying to just en ensure safety. And I did, I was just talking to Bill, trying to get a better explanation of what's going on so we can deal with this with the, uh, and he did the, tell me, he drew it out for me so I can understand it. Yeah, and, it, and after the last discussion, uh, the discussion at the last board meeting, and the time frame of opening up this restaurant, and with the belief that we want to encourage businesses, uh, the board basically said, if they have all their ducks in a row, chief checked on it, they did, that we would go through the formality of affirming the permission at this meeting. So, uh, I'm going to ask for a motion to ratify or affirm the permission for the charity run that took place on April 26th at the fire pit. Motion. Second. Motion by Trustee Forsyth, seconded by Trustee Hupke to affirm the uh, permission given for the charity run. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Forsyth. Yes. Mr. Hupke. Yes. Mr. Hank. Yes. And Mr. Gantley. Yes. Okay. Motion carries. The next item has to do with the American Legion uh, permission for the Memorial Day parade. Uh, and I know this. No, we got that. Never mind. Yeah. Uh, so, Jim, you're here. Yeah. Come on up and yeah. Uh, talk uh, about it. Well, okay. I'm Jim Butler. Uh, I'm the uh, post commander for the Atone American Legion Post 392 and. We're looking for a permission for our annual Memorial Day Parade, I believe that's the 25th. At 9 o'clock in the morning, we're going to form up, and 10 o'clock, the uh, parade will kick off. Motion. <laughs> Second. Motion by Trustee Forsyth, seconded by Trustee Hupke, to approve the annual Memorial Day um, Parade, uh, sponsored by the Pietro American Legion, at the route so designated, beginning uh, at 10 o'clock down the streets as noted. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Forsyth. Yes. Mr. Hill. Yes. Mr. Hack. Yes. Mr. Campbell. Yes. Okay. Motion carries and uh, we look forward to the parade again this week. I'll be up in the Legion. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Next item we have here from the Senior Service Senators of Will County, uh, Jenny Piper. He was the case coordinator, unit yeah, assistant yeah, yeah. director. <laughs> you got it. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving me a few minutes of your time. Um, today I just wanted to briefly explain what Senior Services Center is and what we do. Yeah. Senior Services Center of Will County is a non-for-profit senior agency. 
We provide a wide variety of services. We like to say that we start with a person who is healthy and well and see them through even through the very sometimes very difficult final years of their lives. We offer education programs such as computer programs, um, art classes, um, just a wide variety of classes for our seniors who are able to, to get out and take advantage of this. We offer day trips, extended trips for seniors who are doing well and have, are, you know, want to take advantage of that. We offer what is called information and assistance in our office. This is where a senior or a family member of a senior can call our agency and ask for information pertaining to any situation that they might be experiencing at that point in their time. We can help them relocate. We can try to help them find housing that they can afford. Um, if they're struggling making their utility bills, we can help them access other agencies who have those funds to help pay those bills. We can um, provide information concerning their Medicare Part D so they can have assistance with their drug drugs. Um, we, can off, we can actually run through a computer program so they can make an educated decision as to which drug program would be best for them. These services are offered to all of our seniors and their families at no charge. We do rely on some state and federal United Way funding and also we are now hitting all of the villages and townships and we're also I just want to clarify that Senior Services of Will County is not a county agency. So we're also now going to Will County asking for additional help. As I'm sure many of you are aware of with the Illinois budget, we've experienced some drastic cuts in what we receive. The payments that we receive are also very late and it has really hindered what we can do. Right now my agency is experiencing a, a, a freeze on hiring and it's making it almost impossible for us to perform these duties that we want to do to keep our seniors safe in their homes because we don't have the money to pay the staff to do this. Some of the other programs that we do, we do a full-blown comprehensive assessment on any individual 60 years of age and this is where a caseworker will go into the home and evaluate every aspect of that person's life. They're going to look at what they can do on their own, what they need some help with. And then we try to link them up with services. Through my own agency, we can hook them up to the Illinois Department on Aging's program where a homemaker can come into that home and help them with a wide variety of things to keep them in their home safe. Another piece that we're doing now is the Adult Protective Services. At one point in time, we were only doing um, our, in our senior 60 ages, 60, 60 ages, 60 years of age and older. Now the state has mandated that we now do the 18 plus population who have disabilities. Mm -hmm. There again, we did not get any additional money to do this, so we're trying to do it basically with the same staff that we were trying to do with our seniors. Um, today I'm coming to ask you to, to think about the services that we do. Feel free to contact me at any time if you have further questions. Um, we're, we're asking for some help. We are asking for a $500 contribution from the village of Piatone. And I believe you should have gotten a letter with, with some of the statistics. I'm sure the trustees have it in their packet. And when I had talked to uh, Kathy, I'd asked her if she could get a clarification in terms of when you talk about Piatone, are you talking about the, the village, village or the township? The township it's, or the zip code? It's my understanding, I do have to admit to you, I, I am not 100% certain with that. When I reviewed the records that I have access to, I uh -huh. went by zip code. So I don't know if that comes into play or not. I, I had where we were actually doing for the eight, for the work that I do in my department is what I was talking about the homemaker services doing the comprehensive assessment doing the abuse investigations I had that we had seen 53 seniors within the Piatone but I was going by zip code okay. I can try to get further clarification on that 
the number that you're seeing, 187, uh -huh. that also included um, the information and assisting calls that come right into the office. So sometimes I, we're not always getting streets. So, and I know that's going to dictate. Somebody comes to the office for help, or they talk to you on the phone. They they can call us on the phone. Okay. And we do have an 800 number that I noticed that um, when I went on your web page, I seen that you had some links for, for services mm -hmm. for seniors, and I noticed that we weren't on there at all. We'll be so, happy to put yeah, you Yeah, because there is an 800 number, so there wouldn't be any, any charge for the, for the senior in this area to even call us. So I'd be more than happy to provide that to you, too. Okay. And we're just basically just asking for a little help right now. It's, it's kind of a rough road, and I know you're all, we're all, we're all feeling it. I know a lot of the villages and townships that we've been to have expressed concerns about the cuts that might be happening on their end, too. But we're just asking for, for a little help right now. We've also had a, a local organization, which uh, Mrs. Batterman, who uh, works primarily out of the Catholic Church. And I'm assuming the two of you work together from time to time? From where? Uh, St. Paul's. The Catholic Church. Oh, Paul's. yeah. They, um, they were, did a lot of the meal programs right now. Okay. They, were, they were helping with our nutrition program. Okay. Unfortunately, the nutrition program we lost because we could not maintain it financially. But another agency has taken over that. So we're working very closely with them right now to make sure the seniors are still getting their meals. Okay. My, our department is actually the one that goes out and does the assessment to make sure that they meet the eligibility requirements. So we're, we're, try, we're working with them. But that piece of it, we don't have direct, we don't get any money for that right now, I guess. Is. Okay. And I think one of the things that you're, you, you really stressed at this point in time is <coughs> Providing these services to seniors has become difficult because the state has been holding money, holding or, money. or just cutting you back, yeah. uh, yes. or in giving you additional responsibilities. I think they're called unfunded mandates. Yes, that's uh, exactly what it is. And we, right. We've had we've had a lot. Just one other thing that sure. I I want to mention, and this isn't something that I'm asking for financial help with, but. We're starting um, a self-neglect task force right now, and this is for, um, we're working with the senior plus population and some of the young, some of the disabled citizens, and these are individuals, they're, they're abusing themselves, basically. Mm -hmm. And I'm asking for anyone, if anyone knows of someone who might be, be want become part of this to help us gain um, more linkage, help with providing services you're looking for volunteers uh, probably down the road yeah we're this okay. is all what we're finding throughout will county not I'm not just saying it's here in Piatone it's across the board in will uh -huh. county where we're finding more and more seniors who I know it's a big you know buzzword right now who are hoarders and it can be hoarders of anything from paper to actually we're finding in some of the rural areas, actual hoarders of animals, but the animals aren't outside, they're in their homes. So, you know, we're, we're looking, we don't have a lot of expertise with some of this, so we're just kind of just putting that out there, asking for people if you have ideas or resources, or if you know someone who is an expert in this field, to let us know. Okay, and I think one of the things uh, that you'll need to do before you leave is make sure you talk to uh, Karen Javi from... Okay. Uh, I, I, I was going to say Russell Publications, uh, <laughs> Cornerstone Media okay. Publications, uh, but the trustees, the questions come up. They're asking for 500 bucks. I applaud the cause. However, I don't think that I can stand behind a, what amounts basically to a forced contribution from our taxpayers. Because effectively that's what it is. It's a donation from the tax base to the entity. And while I'm more than happy to provide personally, I don't think that we should do it as a government organization. That's just my stance on it. I would agree, and I would ask my fellow trustees to step forward and maybe even make May the, the month we contribute uh, to this cause, but we can all contribute our uh, earnings for that month. So I'd be willing to do that, but not in the village level. I. Uh, I agree with Trustee Forsyth and Callahan, but also we have a fund 
that I continuously question mm -hmm. that is there under the community functions. And we do have money there for th this is a community function. Um, so therefore, in my opinion, we would not be forcing somebody to be paying for a service that um, seniors really need. Um, with that being said, um, I um, agree and would openly uh, donate a month of my salary to this organization also. Do we use that fund that Trustee Hupke referred to? I know, I know some of our line items are, are not used on an annual basis. Is that particular fund used routinely? And if so, what for? It is used for things that come up throughout the year. It is typically not used for charitable purposes or support purposes. Um, but we I guess my first question is legally, can we, can the village as, a, as an entity do that? Um, there is a history in Illinois of the general principle that a governmental entity cannot contribute tax dollars to a charitable entity. I will tell you that I did some research on this, um, you know, just just recently because I, of course, know a, a number of villages do, and, and, and there. so I. I took a look at it and did uh, did some reading on it, and basically it comes down to this: there is no express prohibition, and the authority to spend the tax money is for under the health welfare, general health and welfare clause that we have here uh, for the village, and uh, the articles made the point that um, in the area of disabilities and seniors, in particular. And due to the what, what they call the new modern trend, is to say that if the trustees feel uh, specifically that it is a direct benefit to the health and welfare of their citizens, that it would not necessarily be be illegal. I will tell you that the history of Illinois, though, is a very a, a fairly strict standard, and obviously you run into the issue of well. Does that mean the village can give money to the cancer society or mm -hmm. to? Mm -hmm. and, and the answer to that would be no. The only way that you could do you, you could do it lawfully would, would be for you, as the group of trustees, to just come to the opinion that this is specific enough to your citizens and is specific enough to their health and welfare that you would feel it would be okay. And then what I would tell you is nobody is going to challenge it or set it aside. But I will also tell you that you are correct in general. We are not to be giving tax dollars uh, to, you know, charitable, um, for, for charitable causes. Okay, does that answer it well enough for everybody? I mean, yeah, I, I think we, we owe our seniors a lot, but I am concerned, like Trustee Callahan said, that I hate to see us do it from the village standpoint because there's so many organizations and groups in this community that are worthwhile and could come on where do you draw the line yeah. and we can't afford to support every last one of them so but I am willing to okay. give my and 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 via the, the 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 nods and everything and I'll include myself in that you'll probably get more than the 500 you're asking well, I thank you very much <laughs> I, I really do and we will do be the best stewards of those dollars that we possibly can be Thank, thank, you. thank you so much for I, your time. We will get that off to you as soon as possible. Okay, great. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, next item on the agenda has to do with an ordinance amending the liquor code. And we have with us, uh, uh, Mayor, does that seem that that's an action item? Do we need to uh, make a motion on this uh, for the senior citizen? Um, motion to do what? Um, it's listed as an, an action item. Okay. All right. And what would the... No. Can I help here? Yeah, please do. I, I believe that what you have said that you're going to do is to individually as trustees yes. uh, contribute your um, a, yes. a month. Sorry. Yes. That can be done individually simply by making a, you know, putting a note in there to, to that effect, giving it to uh, the treasurer and having uh, having that done that way. 
So it could be done just individually. I think what he's talking about is do we have to make a motion not to not give them the funds that they're requesting? Oh, no, because if there's no motion to give them, the, it's just a, okay. nothing. Okay. But as far as the individual contributions, my suggestion is you simply note that and put it on the books. Accounting, yeah, well. Or the accounting we could just do personal For accounting checks. purposes, it might be easier just to give you your check. Right. And you write Each person writes an individual check. We put them in one envelope as well. and send them. Yeah. All right. Do it that way. Okay. All right, moving on now to the ordinance amending the liquor license code. Uh, we've got Tom Knuth here who helped us draft this. Uh, trustees, most of this as it stated uh, in the, the little write-up that you've got, we've prepared the uh, amendments we need to make to the Village Liquor Code. Most of these have been generated by the state liquor code changes of the past several years, and it has to do with hearings, procedures, enforcement actions, uh, and there's some language changes that the state requires us to put in. And they also left the uh, amount of fines up to local control. And as you look through this section, you will find highlighted in yellow the references to the fines and the maximum fines no more than 15,000 in a license period, which is one year. Uh, is a maximum, and if you go to page five, it lists the hearing procedure and the stair steps of fines that can take place for first violation, second violation, and so on, uh, with the 15,000 being the maximum. Now, also included, the nothing has changed in there. We can do immediate suspensions, and we can we can ask the state to revoke. So, immediate suspensions is per the state, or is that something we're adding ourselves? No, it's per the state, I believe, isn't it, Tom? It's per the state, and it's getting codified if you pass this. Okay. Yeah. State says um, for. Go ahead, Tom. Section, but don't. Okay. Yeah. Continued operation will immediately threaten the welfare of the community. Uh, your liquor commissioner, your mayor, really. Uh, can suspend um, for up to seven days. We still have to give a hearing. That was not in our prior section, but nonetheless, stay yeah. allowed. So the last few suspension hearing processes we've been to, um, we just think it's better. The state law does control it, but we know that the applicants and the people that are fighting these are certainly looking at our ordinance. And that, that was, a, you know, the primary crux of what we're doing in there. Uh, the fine things, understand those are relating to the liquor violations in effect of licensee. Um, this ordinance does pick up and allow us, if we want, to also take them into ordinance violation court and prosecute them not with those larger fines as stated in this order, but under normal ordinance violation stuff as an additional tool for maybe the errant bartender that likes to serve the wrong people, that kind of thing. So I call it a recodification and a cleanup is really what this is. So, trustees, other questions? The $15,000 max, is that based on any sort of formula, or is that just the... It's copy the state number? code is what it is. Is that, okay. And certainly, I, you know, I don't think it's the intention uh, to go there. That's one of those, we could do this if we wanted to kind of things. And, you know, if we ever go in that neighborhood of finding, um, it would take an extraordinary set of facts, I would say. Okay. And I will say from past experience, the, the fine system which we've used, which basically follows a similar thing to what's outlined here, uh, has been very effective in getting things turned around in situations where we have had some problems. Uh, and this, as, it, as was indicated earlier, puts in some of the time limits that the, the state has since put into effect since our original ordinance was written. What are the things you're aware this new one does pick up that uh, the police officer on the scene, if you will, has the authority to do an immediate shutdown in a, we'll call it an emergency situation, which we have had. And that was not in the code. I kind of think it's happened before, but we feel a little more statutorily comfortable incorporating it in here because um, if there's a big fight and we got to throw everybody out, 
We'd like some language that says Office of Peace Job. Although it's not up today, if, if the board chose to in the future, it could make this ordinance less restrictive, right? I believe so. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this would be ordinance number 15-03, amending the provisions of the Piatone Village Code relating to liquor license procedures within the Village of Piatone. Uh, is there a motion to adopt? Ordinance 15-03. Motion. Motion by Trustee Hack, seconded by Trustee... Second. Hupke to approve Ordinance 15-03. <coughs> Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mr. Hack. Yes. Mr. Hupke. Yes. Mr. Forsyth. Yes. And Mr. Callahan. Yes. Okay. Motion carries and Ordinance 15-03 is approved, amending the liquor code as noted for the village of Piotone. First item on the agenda has to do with the 2015 tree service contract. George. Village staff has advertised for bids on the 2015 tree service contract. The contract scope of work is removing and trimming trees on parkways and public property, stump grinding and emergency tree removal. Included in the project specifications are requirements for the contractor to have an emerald ash borer compliance agreement with the Illinois Department of Agriculture and also to have an arborist on staff. AAA Tree Services Incorporated and Arnold's Tree Service picked up bid packets. Only AAA Tree Service submitted a bid. The contractor completed all line item costs but did not extend the prices to wait the bid. Staff has completed that extension. The bid sheet was structured so that when evaluating the bids, the greater weight was placed on the work we were most likely to use. The weighted bid amount of $297.65 is for bid evaluation purposes only and does not reflect the cost of completing any specific line item of work. The unit price the contractor will charge and be paid is found in the unwanted unit unweighted unit cost column. AAA Tree Service has worked for the village in years past to provide excellent service. Okay. George, where do we advertise for this? In the Piatone Vedette. That's where we have to. Because to me, it seems like historically, it's always been one bid that we've received. And I know there's millions of tree companies out there. I would really like to see a, a competitive price to make sure that Triple A's even giving us the best price. I, I don't know if we have to advertise in a paper north, south, east, west, but I, I just don't like the fact that every year it seems like it's just one bid. When you stated we have to, is that because it's a in-town publication? Yes. That's why it has to be that mm -hmm. one. But we could publish in more than one publication. We right? theory, I suppose we could publish yes. in more than one publication, yes. Okay. <coughs> Question is how far? Um, this puts us in a position here. Uh, we have to, at this point, if either proceed with this by ac accepting it or rejecting all bids. I Correct. Move. Reject all bids and rebid or accept this bid. Yeah. I move to reject them and rebid it, re advertise. See if we can't get a couple more. I, I, you, we have nothing to compare it to, so you don't know mm -hmm. if they're being fair or not. I mean, I know historic, or in the past, they've always done the village work, but I just think we need more bids. Okay. Do we have the authority to reject the bid? Yep. Without, yes. Uh, is that sufficient Well, reason? I'm sure that's in the specs. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I didn't ask, I should have, but all of our specs give us the authority to reject all this. The standard practice, you can you can do it. I note that, you know, you did get two bids. Mm -hmm. I don't know where Arnold's is from, um, but they elected not to, uh, not to bid. I don't know if any timing is um, important. Here. Um, yeah, how long will the bidding process take place again? Is this something that could be on well, the Well, I'll second? say one other thing, and of course the publication uh, will cost more money again, especially the wider mm -hmm. you, you publish it. I don't know what the costs are, but the debt's fairly reasonable if you move to... It's, and something like this, it's typically two to three hundred dollars into the debt. Right. And, and it's going to be... run for two weeks. Yeah, and it's going to be a little bit more in a broader... In probably the broader base yeah, news. That's yeah. the question. How far do we go days, with it? Right. Less than ten days. Ten days. Time, ten know. days. Not less than ten days. When the well, vedette is publishing or 
putting this in the paper? Are they doing it just in the Piatone paper? Or are they doing it in their um, publications would, in the other towns that they have? I would say that they probably have it in all the other communities because that's typically what we see. Yeah. Karen? I don't know. Question about I know we do help one at Anson in Beecher. Well. It goes in. So Beecher, Moni, and Mantino yeah, have seen it? Yeah. But I don't know about it. I've never specifically looked for the What she said? She said you could. She doesn't know. They do. Yeah. In other words, we could do it, but you don't know for sure whether or not it was this particular one was done in all papers. I'm not the one to tell you. Yeah, I, I know. You're, I don't you're, deal that's with not the your department. I'm sorry. Okay. I can ask at the office, but. About what do we spend on. This tree service. We typically budget fifty thousand dollars. Yeah. How much of that we spend is a function sometimes of how many storms we have. But is it close to fifty or is it yeah. ten? It, okay. No, it's close. It's typically you know probably forty or so. Yes. Okay. okay. And a, it's been that way since the Emerald Ash bore, and hopefully in a year or two we'll be finished. And part of part of that is due to the fact that you have to have certain set certification in order to. Do no, I, I and get not, all not that. I just does. don't like the fact that it's always one bid. I don't know why we don't have more. Something just to compare numbers. Yeah. Is the month right. delay going to affect things drastically? If we have, um, no, if we have an emergency, we'll still use AAA because we'll just extend those prices. They've done that in the past. Um, I, I would say if we're going to rerun the ad, we should just stay with uh, the publication we're using, just make sure that it's in all of their papers. And do one more run with it. At that, well, can we find out if it if it already ran that? I think we'll probably end up with the same results. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if if it did run that, maybe try like the day, you know, the Daily Journal or the Juliet Herald or something. I don't know. Well, if it did run already, I mean, we, we we've given plenty of opportunity for people to to, to submit their bids at that point. You know, how, how much further do you want to go with it? I you just know. would like something to compare it to. But so would I. I. But if they're not willing to bid, they're not willing to bid. Yeah. I mean, uh, you can't force them to bid. Um, I got no problem tabling it until to find out if what publications it ran in. Um, if it ran into all the publications, then I, I think we've met our requirement. But then we potentially waste two extra weeks before one a decision is made. One week, on yeah. Work. Well, what? Yeah, you're right. Two weeks. Two weeks. Does it require board approval to offer new bids? I think you have to. Well, re to rebid, yes, you have to, you have to reject, you reject all, all bids and authorize it that it be rebid. Okay, that so would be the motion. They, they they must go together. It's not possible. Oh no, we don't have to go together. I, I'm simply <coughs> wondering if it might be possible to postpone rejecting the bid until we have a further idea. Yeah, we can table it. Well, oh, sure. It should but be at the open same for time, 60 days in the bid specs, I would think. At the same time, the administrator has the authority to proceed to publication for new bids if so no, we can get the clock running. To do, no, we can't proceed to do that until we, re, it, we have to reject all the current bids right. for him to do that. So that would have to take place at the next meeting. Uh, but what you can do is this, and, and as was pointed out before, we're moving it two weeks is what it is. Uh, so the, the indication here is to table this for two weeks. In the meantime, research to see what the circulation actually was in that, so we know for a fact what it was. And also, uh, would would the board suggest if we go to another area to go south or go north with where we publish? I'd like to keep it in the county yeah. if we're going to, to expand, which would be north, right? No, that goes no. west. No, so, well, <laughs> because well, if it's I been mean. published in all three newspapers, all, all the newspapers here, it basically is a circle around us. Right. I'm, I'm considering Joliet North. That's, I mean, yeah, I no, wasn't that's west. It's north and west. Right. All right. So, uh, so I'm taking this as a motion to 
table this until the next meeting. In the meantime, do some research. Okay. A motion. You got that one now? Mm -hmm. Okay. A motion. Motion by Trustee Forsyth, Sorry. seconded by Trustee Hack to table this until the next meeting and uh, do a little research on how, how widely was this circulated and where might we go to next if we have to reject and bid, bid it over. If I may, yeah. just, just to cut to the chase a little bit, if, there, if it was in fact published in the Vedette, the Voni Record, the Beecher Herald, the Mantino, whatever the Mantino mm -hmm. is, is there a consensus among the board that that's satisfactory? That's or satisfactory. do we just need, because if that's not the case, then we might as well go ahead and reject bids and re-advertise. That's satisfactory for me, but that's my opinion. I'll go with it. I still want <laughs> to see, see another number. Do you see my yes. point? I mean, that's that's one of the decisions. Yeah. I understand. I, I, I kind of agree with Trustee Forsyth. If it if it did go to all of those, we've tried, but it, it's just disappointing that we keep getting just one bid. So I'll, I'm with you. I'll go with it. Could there be a suggestion next time we do this that it is put another? Just more than just Russell publications, so we don't have this again, so that we can put it out sure, there again. Okay. It, it, there's a cost factor involved. That's why it, it hasn't been done. Before. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> motion and second. Mm -hmm. Okay. Clerk, 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 call the roll. Mr. Forsyth. Yes. Mr. Hack. Yes. Mr. Callahan. Yes. Mr. Hupkin. Yes. Okay. Motion carries. This is table till the next meeting, and we're doing research on it in the meantime. Uh, item F: Authorization to purchase cyber insurance through the Illinois Municipal Insurance Cooperative. make, which is the Illinois Municipal Insurance Cooperative, our property liability insurance cooperative, has offered a new policy covering cybersecurity. The title is somewhat misleading as the policy covers not only electronic data, but in the case of security and privacy liability, paper documents as well. The policy is covered through Beasley Incorporated, which has a, an A invest rating of A14, A15, pardon me, A15. Coverage lines include breach response expenses, data restoration, network security liability, privacy liability, privacy regulatory proceedings, media liability, cyber extortion, and business interruption. We have been quoted two premiums, $2,010 and $3,190. The policy differs only in coverage limits. And I think uh, you are included. Some of the things that would be covered as breach response expenses includes crisis management including notification cost credit monitoring public relations expenses from a breach or privacy breach data restoration pays for the cost of restoration of any data stored network security liability provides liability coverage for damages and claim expenses arising out of an actual or alleged act privacy liability uh, coverage if an insured fails to protect personal protected information uh, privacy regulatory proceeding, coverage for defense expenses from a reg regulatory proceeding resulting from a violation uh, of a policy law caused by a covered security breach, media liability, um, covers perils that result from an error or omission in content of their website, of our website, cyber extortion, provides ex uh, coverage for expenses and or losses incurred as a result of an extortion threat, and that's basically where a hacker comes in. Uh, and frankly, it looks like police departments are becoming a popular target. Comes in, uh, takes over your site, and says, you can have your site back when you pay me X number of dollars. Um, business interruption provides coverage for business interruption, loss, and or business restoration expense as a result of security breach that caused the system to failure. Uh, you're quoted two policies. The primary, the coverage, the exposures covered are the same. The difference is in the um, in the coverage and media liability. 
but under maximum policy aggregate it goes from one million to two million um, privacy and security liability one million to two million media liability one million to two million uh, network extortion one million to two million um, I think everybody everything else is pretty much the same between the two policies this is being covered through IMEC on a we received uh, quotes as a collective, but it's up to individual members whether they wish to whether they wish to um, participate or not. So, so in, no in essence, this is adding to an existing policy liability policy that we have with this group. That is correct. This additional coverage. It's like a rider, I think. Okay. Or one million or two million. Jim. As far as the liabilities are concerned, are we protected under governmental immunity for most of those items? To some extent. Um, I'll give you a recent example. We had a, um, an inadvertent release of uh, Social Security numbers and other things from um, the entity in response, essentially in response to a FOIA that wasn't properly screened. Okay. And, and and that was protected? Yeah. Okay. There, I mean, there are things that can occur. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I realize how big the yes, we do. We also have got our governmental immunities also uh, uh, apply. Right. You know, when they when they apply. And our policy in place now doesn't cover any of these items. It covers some of them at a much lower, like fifty thousand dollar rate. I don't think this is warranted. That's just my opinion. Any other trustees? I have a question for the chief. Chief, how important do you think this is for your department? Our network is protected by a uh, because we uh, we use a function called Net Motion. It's through our 911 system, how our network runs. If they have a net motion, they have a net motion license. For instance, if our computers are taken, uh, we can tell them to shut off net motion and they'll kill it and then it's just a dead box. It can't connect to the the, uh, the back door the firewall that are created. I am the last of the geek squad <laughs> on matters of this level. Uh, it's you know, we at the police department, our records and information about people are all stored at the 911 center. Uh, we don't have any records of police reports. I mean, we we remotely look at things. We don't have, I mean, we have our hard copies, but all that's stored at a 911 center, and that's all uh, as most concerned. But hackers can be hackers. So we know they can get anywhere. It's not... It's, uh, you know, and people look and, you know, the bad thing about it is, as you well know, because you watch the world, is they can hold you at bay and control your whole network, whether or not you let them function. You have to almost, uh, similar to a movie, hold you hostage. And I don't know how prevalent that is, but it seems like in today's world, you can never think or not think something can't happen. But... Uh, I'm yeah. gonna, yeah. That'll happen whether we have an insurance policy or not. I mean, the insurance won't prevent that from happening. Are we, I guess I'd like to ask our attorney, I mean, we have several exposures. One of them is the credit card reader at the front counter. Another one is logging into our website to ePay. My understanding of federal law, even though it's on ePay's thing, we have some exposure there. Some? If there is, if there is a hack, and if it would be a hack, it would be just us. It would be a lot of other people. Um, would be would governmental governmental immunity apply there because there are some regu federal regulations that fall into place right. that aren't civil issues. They're they're regulatory issues. If this happens, you will do this. Right. As to what they, yeah. I and I would have to tell you this. If if you want me to uh, give you a more 
detailed kind of thought and, and really look at what are your real liabilities here but before you do this, I can certainly uh, do that. I'm not really prepared to do that. I, it, one of the things that occurs here, and, and there has not been any liability that I'm aware of through you know, court cases or where we've been sued for, for anything. But when something like that happens, you have a, a PR nightmare. Um, and if you have you know, the coverage is to, for example, the first thing that needs to be done is if, if people's information has been hacked or is out there, they have to immediately go into all the credit bureaus, make sure all the, the, <laughs> the proper documents are, are filed and all that kind of stuff to stop it. And my guess is the insurance covers that and takes care of it uh, for you. So, you know, one of the sides of this is not just the liability but it is the protection and the coverage that it gives to any of the citizens or anybody else that you know, it may, it may occur, occur to. How likely it is to occur, I'm sort of like the chief there, I guess, uh, you know, all the systems are different uh, as to what can be hacked and how easily and... Uh, Early it worked for Target and some other yeah. major yeah. corporations. Right. And, and as I said, it, it's, it's very bad publicity. It's very nice, I, I suspect, to be able to say, well, uh, if, if that occurred, uh, we're covered. This is what you do. A, B, C, you call, they pay for it, I assume. No, I, I mean, I don't know what the policy reads. But I also don't want to... I haven't looked at the policy either, by the way, so... I don't want to simplify what insurance companies yeah. do, though. The insurance company policy will almost certainly state that they will defend the village against action brought against the village or pay for the defense. They could settle claims, they could not settle claims. And it's not all that uncommon that insurance companies take the position of you have a claim, we're not paying it, sue us. And we'll defend it in court. It happens quite frequently and so I don't want it to be, um, I, don't, I don't want the rest of the board to be led to believe that all it takes is a claim to be filed and there's there's a check in the mail. That, that is not always how it works. Well, and also I don't know what the policy provides. In other words, what when they say they have coverage for liability, does that mean that will they take certain actions in the event certain breaches occur and, and, and pay for it? Or does somebody have to sue us and, and recover and only then do they respond? I, I don't know what the policy does. I would like more information on this. I'd make a motion that we table it until we get more information on this. Second. And a motion by Trustee Hepke, second by Trustee Forsyth to table this to get more information. Yeah, we'll look at it. I'll, I'll yeah. talk to George and we'll, and, and we may have already done this in the office. It's coming out from Gallagher. Yeah. Probably did. I just haven't seen it yet. Okay. Uh, Clerk, call the mm -hmm. roll. Mr. Hopkins? Yes. Mr. Forsyth? Yes. Mr. Callahan? Yes. Mr. Hack? Yes. Okay. Motion carries, and this is tabled uh, to the next meeting. Next item on the agenda has to do with uh, acknowledging the re resignation of Don English from the Economic Development Advisory Committee. Uh, as noted in the uh, insert that she had earlier she had a job change and she's no longer in the area uh, she's been with first midwest bank and um, so this is a mere formality of acknowledging the fact that uh, she has resigned creating a vacancy which i will fill and bring to you probably in the next by the next meeting because i've got a lot of other things to do um, so, is there a motion to acknowledge the resignation of Don English from the Economic Development Advisory Committee? Well, oh. second. Motion by Trustee Forsyth, seconded by Trustee Huffkey to acknowledge the resignation of Don English from the Economic Development Advisory Committee. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Forsyth? Yes. And Mr. Huffkey? Yes. Mr. Hack? Yes. Mr. Killian? Yes. Okay. Motion carries. Uh, Next item has to do, it's a proclamation of police week. And that is the 
week of, I'm going to search through my insurance papers here. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the week of May 10th through 16th, 2015, um, to recognize and honor the service and sacrifice of those law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty pr while protecting our communities. Is there a motion, motion. to? Motion. Second. Okay. Motion by Trustee Forsyth. Seconded by Trustee Hupke to adopt the proclamation for National Police Week, the week of May 10 through 16, 2015. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Forsman. Yes. <coughs> Mr. Hupke. Yes. Mr. Hack. Yes. Mr. Callahan. Yes. Okay. Motion carries, and that is hereby approved. Um, the on the possible release of executive session minutes uh, in our previous executive session we have indicated that we wish to release the following executive session minutes November 10 of 2014 April 14 of 2014 January 27 of 2014 January 13 of 2014 subject number one February 11th of 2013, subject number one. January 14th of 2013. And finally, November 23rd of 2009, subject two. Motion. Second. Okay, motion by Trustee For uh, Forsyth, seconded by Trustee Hupke to release those executive session minutes. Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Forsyth. Yes. Mr. Hupke. Yes. Mr. Callahan? Yes. Mr. Hank? Yes. Okay. Motion carries and that's going to be released. I gotta ask. You've been sitting there so quietly. <laughs> Tell us who you are. I'm Artun Suchenko. I'm Wayne Callahan. So. Well, you gotta go to the microphone. <laughs> okay? Because we're going to get you in the minutes, number one, is yeah. being here. Hi. Uh, I'm Artun Suchenko. I live on 528 Hickory. Um, I'm trustee Wayne Callahan's son. And oh! I'm just looking in here to talk to Chief Civil Engineer. Oh, okay. I thought you had some business no. that you wanted to bring to. I'm no, sorry about that. Funny. You should have nudged me. No, that was funny. Okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. That's what Chris wanted to happen anyway, so oh, okay. <laughs> everyone's happy. Oh, he, was, he was dressed so nicely, I figured he's got some kind of business he wants to bring up here and he just doesn't know when to do it. Can I ask him why you were mowing the grass the other day and you were letting him off the hook? <laughs> <laughs> off the record. Okay. All right. Uh, any announcements? Any bills due or anything like this? Uh, yes, 30th of April, water bills due. Okay. And that's it. That's it for now. All right. Any other announcements, trustees? Just to add one thing. Uh, we were, several of us went to the fire, fire pit. Uh, soft opening over the weekend. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the general consensus is. Oh, it's good. Good. So, looking forward to going back there again. All right. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion. motion. Second. Okay. Motion by Trustee Hepke, second by Trustee Hack to adjourn the April 27, 2015 Village of Pietro Memorial. Certainly, call the roll. Mr. Hepke. Yes. Mr. Hack. Yes. Mr. Callahan. Yes. Mr. Forsyth. Yes. Motion carries. We are adjourned. Okay.